Hello. In this video, we will learn about springs and the forces they produce. You have probably seen a spring before. Springs are used in a wide variety of tools, from the scales you step on to measure your weight to the cars you drive to get places. Here we have a spring that is attached on one end to an anchor, which means that part of the spring does not move at all. On the other end, we have a mass attached to the spring. If you were to just let the spring be and not exert any forces on that mass, the spring would have a certain length. We call that length the rest length. But if you stretch the spring beyond its rest length, the spring will fight back and it will exert a force that tries to return the spring to its rest length. That force is directed back towards the anchor since that is the direction it needs to go to return to its rest length. Similarly, if you compress the spring so that it is shorter than the rest length, it will exert a force away from the anchor so that it can stretch back to its rest length. So we see that the spring force will act along the spring in whatever direction will restore it to its rest length. So now the question is, how strong is this spring force? Well, here is the equation. Let's work through all the parts to understand what it means. That K is called the spring constant, and it depends on the spring itself. Each spring might have its own constant. Some springs might be very hard to compress or stretch, which means that those springs have a high K constant. Other springs might be very easy to stretch or compress, and that means that they have a low K constant. Next, we have this quantity in parentheses, x minus rest length. The x refers to the actual position of the mass at the tip of the spring. So we take that position and we subtract it by the rest length. This just tells us how much we have stretched or compressed the spring. The more we stretch it or compress it, the stronger the force will be. The sign of this quantity also tells us whether we have stretched or compressed the spring. For instance, imagine that the spring's rest length is 1 meter. If it is currently 1.5 meters long, then we do 1.5 minus 1 and we get a positive 0.5 meters. This means the spring was stretched by 0.5 meters. On the other hand, if the current length was 0.7 meters, we would do 0.7 minus 1 and get negative 0.3, which means the spring is compressed by 0.3 meters. Now, let's look at the whole equation again. There is a negative sign in front. This is how that works. If the spring is stretched, then the quantity in parentheses is positive, as we just examined. But because of the negative up front, the force will be negative, which means it is pointing in a compressing direction. This makes sense. If the spring is stretched, then the force will try to compress it. On the other hand, if the spring is compressed, which means the quantity in parentheses is negative, then the term as a whole will be positive, and that means the force will be acting to stretch the spring. Now, just a quick word about the K constant. Like many physical things, it has a unit. In this case, it has to have units that will convert a length into a force since the quantity in parentheses is a length, and the quantity on the other side of the equation is a force. Therefore, the unit of the K constant is a newton per meter. Now, when you multiply a newton per meter by a meter, you will be left with just a newton, the unit of force. Let's do a quick example. Imagine I have a spring with a mass resting on a surface. We will assume there's no friction. Now, let's say I pull on the spring with a certain applied force. What I want to know is, what will the length of the spring be when I pull on it like this? Certainly, it will take some amount of time to stretch to its final position, but I want to know the length after it has reached that stable position. When it has reached a stable position, that means there must be no net acceleration of the mass. So let's write out Newton's second law. The sum of forces will equal ma, which equals zero, since acceleration is zero. Now there are only two forces involved, my pulling force and the spring's force. The minus is because the spring force is pointed to the left. Now, we want to know what the final length of the spring will be, so let us solve for x, since that is the length of the spring. Go ahead, try your algebra skills out on this, and figure it out yourself. First, we will put the spring force on the other side of the equation. Next, we divide both sides by k. Finally, we add the rest length to both sides. Great, we now have an equation. If I were to tell you what the pulling force is, what the spring constant is, and what the rest length is, you would be able to know what the final length is. This whole video, we have been working with the spring force in one dimension. As one final point, I just want to show how we can work with the spring force in a two-dimensional situation. It's very simple, actually. All that changes is we now define the force equation like this. Now, the x vector is the vector that points from the anchor to the mass. The L vector is the vector that points from the anchor to the rest length point on the spring. The X minus L is the vector that points from the rest length point to the mass, as can be seen here. 
Other than that, we have the same equation. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching.